Commander Shepard has been recovered. The Lazarus Project will proceed as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Lazarus Project podcast. This is a Mass Effect podcast held as often as we can in the Ploppy 54 gaming discord. Feel free to come join us and discuss all things Mass Effect. In this podcast, we discuss everything from the characters, the lore, theory, fan theory, opinion, and everything else in between. My name is Manning, aka That Cerberus Guy, and joining me today is Craig. Hello. In this episode, tragically, um, Tim will not be joining us, so Craig and I are flying solo this week, as neither of us are convinced Tim is ever going to finish Andromeda, because this episode is 100% focused on the black sheep of the Mass Effect universe, aka Andromeda. Oh, and again, real quick, I'm sure it doesn't need to be mentioned, but for anyone listening, there will be spoilers in this. So would you like to get us started? on your thoughts on the just a general overview of the story, Craig? The story, I, th- I think if, if you were to like sum up the story for Andromeda, it's, it, to me it seemed like a pretty straightforward story. It seems very simple. The, obviously they, the inhabitants of the Milky Way, they want to go to a new galaxy and explore and inhabit a new galaxy and this evil race are trying to stop them. It's a pretty straightforward story, but that doesn't obviously mean it's a bad story in any way. It's a really good way to branch off of the original trilogy. It was a really clever way of like narrowly avoiding, you know, how many different endings there are for Mass Effect 3. How do you feel like in, in like the most sort of general way, I guess? I honestly think that the story itself is deceptively well written. I mean, we all know the jokes about the buggy animations and the crab walking. And yes, some of the dialogue was silly. Like, I don't think at anyone's ever going to forget the my face is tired line even though it doesn't bother me personally i understand why people say the maps are gigantic and empty but to me that's part of the charm like not to get too far off on a tangent it's like in the original mass effect one people had the same complaints about a lot of the planets you just land and drive around in the mako for forever and you don't really see anything but again and andromeda is kind of the same way but at the same time maybe it's just because i'm such a sci-fi nerd but i love reading about what every planet's like and landing just being able to drive around and explore even if 90 percent of it's pointless just being able to see all these alien worlds i just felt was cool and so and again yes the story does have shortcomings and yes the villains are which we'll get to later are a little bland at least the cat were and some of the characters admittedly did fall a little flat but for the most part i think it was deceptively well written and well told and i mean like not every game needs to be like you off saving the universe sometimes having things on like a smaller scale can be just as fun as long as it's done right and i think andromeda hit more than it missed at least in my personal opinion um (laughs) i was gonna honestly say um what you what you kind of already covered when you mentioned the massive exploration like you know people will criticize like how open world it was but it was exactly what mass effect one was and i think because they were planning to do future games they were clearly setting up something for future games in that galaxy you kind of need a first game where you're exploring everything and finding out everything you can and i do think in some ways actually literally from like reading that lore entry that i was reading before we actually hit record about the the scourge and how this race called the jardan created the scourge in like a bomb explosion details like that i think kind of like i I do think that so often the lore is so much more interesting than certain things in the story and i really wish like details like that all worked into the story in in a lot of ways but no and i 100 percent agree and like for me I'm sure a lot of people, like when they get, even whether it's Mass Effect 1 or Andromeda or 2 or 3 or whatever, a lot of them, when they get to a planet that they can land on, they don't even bother reading about the planet, they just hit land. But I mean, half the fun for me is just like reading the descriptions of the planets and even the ones, like especially Mass Effect 1, because the amount of detail, even like 
every they put into describing every planet was like ludicrous and like some of them like they, they like legitimately make me feel bad that we never got to go to some of these planets like i'll never forget i forget where exactly in the game it is but there's a planet called proteus and if you read the description for it it says that it, the entire planet is essentially one humongous gigantic ocean and it has like 4000 kilometer wide hurricanes on it so the only way people can live is like 40 kilometers beneath the surface in like underground sea colonies and i just i read that i'm like oh my god that's so cool why can't i want to go here and visit and like it's i get the same sort of like i don't know if awe is the right word but i just really wanted to explore like all the planets because each one seems so vibrant and distinct and i just wanted to learn more about them like again that just might be the sci-fi nerd me peeking his head out again though i do think it's in and i and I, i hate that this is creeping in already but I, I do feel that that's a bit of where Andromeda forgot what could have been even better about it. Like, I think when you are exploring a new galaxy and inhabiting a new galaxy, like, especially as an existing Mass Effect fan, if you're playing it as one, hearing all of these details about the galaxy is very interesting. But having that worked into the dialogue would have been way cooler, I think. You know, having... Ryder and his companions find out about these details about the milk the uh, not the milky way finding out all of these details about the andromeda galaxy would have been especially cool because i think there's an element of we're pioneers and we're exploring something unfamiliar and we're learning things that will change our very understanding of the universe and i think that just should have been worked into the dialogue more as well no i 100% agree and it does seem and i guess that kind of ties into like in the trilogy the characters all not to say that the characters in andromeda are bad because they're not by any stretch but i felt like in in the trilogy not only were there more characters but even never mind the regular ones but even the dlc characters i felt like you got to know them a bit more as people like a little bit more about their history than necessarily do about the characters in andromeda i wish they'd fleshed out the backstories a little bit more yeah i will say though like i do feel like at least every companion in andromeda is likable i do feel like everyone who plays the original trilogy there's a weak link usually there's usually one character that somebody really doesn't like for one reason or another whether it's ashley because she's a space rate racist or caden because he's boring or for for you, Manning, it would be Grunt, just because he's just kind of ang- angry Krogan. Everyone seems to have a weak link, but it's kind of hard for me to find one in Andromeda. Yeah, and don't forget Samara. <laughs> yeah, there is Samara there as well. But like you say, even though I wish the, um, the six companions had a bit deeper of backstory, what they have is ser- serviceable, and they, each one of them feels like uniquely distinct from the other they all have their own personalities and it's like liam's this like dorky college undergrad who never grew up i mean like he still wears space that ca- space khakis into battle and instead of like going to space ikea to get like a proper proper furnishings for his room he has like this disgusting old beer stained couch with butter chicken stains on it and he mailed himself a sports car that he's going to be dead for several hundred years or before it even gets to helios when cora setting all the jokes aside about her um being an asari huntress who served on port portiana on lamara or uh, port larama on haitiana i mean whether or not she is or isn't the elusive man's daughter i thought she was a very quirky but also loyal person I mean, Drax, just hilarious. Like, I'm not, anyone who's listened to more than one episode of this knows I'm not a huge fan of the Krogan, but I love Drax. Jaws, interesting, and I love the banter he has with PB. Vetra's like the sweetest, most wholesome person in the world, but she has like a dark side to her if you piss her off. And PB's got like this mental disorder, and um, she's just adorable and quirky, and I love her. Like, even though she's only like, I think it's like five or, Five years younger than Liara, I think. 
no, or, no, eight, sorry. She's eight years younger than Liara. So they're essentially the same age, but they they just come across as completely different people. Like Liara's always, not to say that she doesn't have fun, but she's a, a lot more stoic and reserved. Whereas PB, like when you first meet her and she first comes on the Tempest and Roger's like, don't you need to get anything? And she's just like, I have a toothbrush and a clean pair of underwear. I'm good to go. It's just like, she's so youthful and vibrant. It's just like, I love, like all of them, I, for one reason or another, I kind of love all six of them. Well, I think you really covered all of them there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure you have something you'd like to add. I just, I find it very interesting that um, uh, PB's not that much younger than Liara. Like, I feel like she's got so much energy, I was fully expecting you to say that she was 30 years younger or something. No, she's 100 when the game takes place, which means Liara would have been 108. So nine, 2077 versus 2085. And I think my favorite thing about Liam is just like his deadpan, like ridiculous sense of humor. Like towards the end of the game where PB's talking to everyone about how she's going, she's like, ever since I've been here, I'm going to, I've wanted to have one step out or one foot out the door. But she's like, after spending all this time with you, she's like, I really st am starting to consider you my family. And she's like, so I'm going to stay. And then everyone's like, well, that's it. And then she's like, yeah, that's it. And then she's like, well, so who wants to help me come clean up this mess in my my room? And then everyone has an excuse to not help. And I love Liam's just like, I can't. I have to make ice. <laughs> like, it's such a stupid line. Like, I'm going to use that in real life at some point. I have to go make ice. Is that the, is that the, um, I think I remember that playing out in um, a romance scene, but I don't know if it's the same one if you don't romance her. But like, she does have this whole thing about, yeah, like essentially having a foot out the door, and um, I don't know. I, I suppose it would still be the same scene, actually. Yeah, where they where they're all gathered in that sort of main hollow table room, essentially. Yeah, I can't remember for a hundred percent, but my first ever playthrough, I played as a female rider because I was like, I have a tendency to when I play as a male character that allows full customization to make a character look as close to me in real life as I can and then role play as myself. And I'm sure other people do that too. So my first playthrough of Andromeda, I was like, I want to experience this game without like me forcing myself onto the character. So I'm going to play as a girl so I can just experience it. And then I'll go back and replay it as a guy. And I romance Jaw. And I don't remember if that scene happened because it's been like six years now almost. And if it did, I don't remember if it happened the same way. But other than one time romancing Vetra, I've always romanced PB after that. Yeah, I do I do kind of need to romance Vetra at some point. But I just, I found um, Giles' romance especially to be like quite, quite sweet and quite moving. I feel like um, just the Angara in general were done really well. I think in a couple of ways it's not expanded on as well as it could be like I, I i did see someone do a playthrough of andromeda recently and it's really strange that a they get familiar enough to start talking english very quickly but also um they start using terms that Ry does not even introduce them to like the cat and um actually i don't know i think they they were they're the first ones to to, to use the word cat anyway but the remnant, they 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 call them the rem remnant, despite the fact that we previously learned that PB gave them that name. And th there were little things that they clearly like sort of glossed over and didn't think enough about. But as a race, they're really interesting and they're really sort of caring and loving and um, sentimental. And it's hard not to love them. I thought they were very. At first, I was a little. I don't know what the right word is. I wasn't completely sold on them. But Jaw quickly grew on me, and I felt like at least at the beginning that they were they were like really cautious around Ryder and the crew, and like wouldn't give you the time of day until you like prove yourself worthy, which I think is a lot more accurate. Because I mean, it it almost makes me wonder, like, because not to say everyone in the trilogy is buddy buddy, but they've all been like interacting for the better part of three decades. So it was so I mean, like everyone knew who everyone else was. So to like actually truly see like an actual first contact was cool and like it was interesting watching Jaw try to more than once play peace break or peace that yeah, peacemaker between the angara and 
the crew of the Tempest. As much as I love Jarl, there are certain parts that feel a bit rushed. Jarl is like your first, like like you said, Jarl and the Angara are like your first proper exposure, like your first actual contact, because, you know, the, the cat you don't really interact with, you kind of just kill them on sight. And it just seems a bit strange that Jarl is so standoffish for like the first five minutes. And then after, you know, a few missions, he's suddenly like buddy buddy with everyone. And I do feel like um, they could have spaced it out more and made it like very special. They could have made it truly special if you saw more of him being standoffish before you see him becoming this open, loving guy. To be fair, Drak is kind of the same way. Like the first time you meet him, like he's not overly violent, but he just kind of gives you the cold shoulder. You talk for like 30 seconds and then he just like pieces out and leaves. And he's, it takes a little while for he, even him to warm up to you as well. But like, and again, like I said, it just goes to show how each character has like their own quirks and strengths and weaknesses. It's like, I'll never forget like the one time I wouldn't say it was because I wanted a female Garrus, but the first time I romanced Vetra, when it, I was like, oh, this, it's like, it was like two high school kids falling in love. And it was like so sweet. And like that scene where she tries to make you a steak, but like burns the hell out of it. And then she feels awful. And then Ryder like consoles her. And then it's just like the most wholesome thing I think I've seen in quite a while. And then after that, I was like, yeah, there's no way I can ever romance her again. Cause there's no way a guy as screwed up as I am deserves anyone that wholesome. <laughs> and then, so that's why I've been taken to romancing PB. Cause I just love how she's in a way she's the same thing. Cause she's like very, aloof and impulsive like just look at her loyalty mission where she tricks you into going into the escape pod and then launches it without anyone's notice or without telling anybody and then like even if you romance her she's for the first for forever she's talking about how she doesn't want any strings or nothing at all it's just a fling and then you go into the escape pod and she gives you like a zero gravity blowjob and then it's everything's just like silly and goofy and like fun and nothing serious but then by the end she does like a complete 180 and she's like so embarrassed that she can't even talk to you. So she gets Pock to like play a pre recorded message for you while she runs away. And then you have to tell her, it's like, no, PB, it's okay. Like, I want strings too. And it's just like, I felt it was like really touching. I think it does seem like another case of um, like in the original trilogy, the aliens are more interesting than the humans. Like, I do get why they have to make the extra effort. They have to give aliens more personality because they noticeably look less relatable to us. But it's just like Cora and Liam, like whilst I like them and I, I do I do like Liam's personality, they don't really have a character arc. They don't grow as people, to my knowledge. I don't I don't believe they like change over the course of the game. And I think maybe that's something that they could have explored more it's just i don't know how do you feel about the comparison of cora and liam versus ashley and caden they're not really comparable are they well ashley and cora are both brash and standoffish and not afraid to tell you how they feel and caden and liam are a bit quieter and a bit more reserved i mean yes i guess liam jokes around a bit more than caden does but and I guess there's some correlation there. At least I saw some. I could be way off. Yeah, I mean, when you mention it, I can kind of see the, the, the similarities there, I, especially with Cora and Ashley. But like you say, I do think Liam's got more personality than Caden does. And I do kind of fall into the camp that, yes, Ashley's got prejudice against aliens, but you can understand why when she tells a story about her father and everything. Um, and and she changes over the course of the game, and that makes her more interesting than Caden. In the first game, I'll 100% agree with you that Caden is super boring, and Ashley's definitely the more interesting of the two. And then you can't really count Mass Effect 2, because they're both only there for one cutscene. But I'd say about Mass Effect 3, like, Ashley does a complete 180 in how she feels, like even to the point where she says that she considers Tally her sister. Caden definitely develops a personality by the third game. 
Maybe I just should have spent more time with him. I do definitely need to do a playthrough where I actually romance Caden. But he just kind of seems like the less appealing option, <laughs> like he usually does to me. I mean, that's fair. But I think there, you can draw some correlations from... Like, the Andromeda characters are all distinct enough that they can stand on their own, but I think most of them had some influence drawn from characters from the trilogy. I mean, like, Drac is just basically an older version of Rex. Um, Vetra is Garrus, basically. I know PB and Liara, I would say, are the only two where they pretty much have nothing in common, other than the fact they both like to research alien dig sites. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's very clear where the inspiration came from, but I think that just comes down to how much they struggled, I think, with the development development of the game. I think there was a whole thing, wasn't there, about how they didn't really know what they were doing with Andromeda when they were developing it for quite a while. Well, there was the whole, I know the original idea was they basically wanted it to be No Man's Sky, where all the planets were procedurally generated. But then at some point along the line, they were like, this isn't going to work. And that they had to scrap it and basically lose, like throw two years of development into the bin in order to start from scratch. So, I mean, knowing that, I could forgive a bit of the shortcomings. Are you happy with the game we got? Or would you have preferred procedurally generated planets and then it, like basically anything goes? Green. Mean procedurally generated planets just kind of sounds way too appealing to say no to doesn't it like i think there are some parts especially about the planet design in general that just felt a little bit just unoriginal you know i mean we see we see so many sand planets like in star wars so I don't think anyone really wants to see more than one sand planet in andromeda but what was the name of that one that the krogan had settled on but yeah, just the the oversaturation of sand planets and I don't know, just it felt like they were not taking as many risks with their planet design ideas. Like, I can't remember if it was a sp specific planet or if it was just a part of one of the planets we'd been to. But on the mission with PB, she goes to recover a, like an artifact or an object. And her old friend or her old fling kind of gets in her way and you kind of got to choose to save her friend in the end or not. That kind of takes place on like a rocky lava type planet. And I think at the end, I honestly have no idea if that's actually a planet we've been to before that. But we definitely haven't been to a rocky lava type landscape area of that planet if we have. And that clearly, seemed like a massive missed opportunity. Clearly that planet was Mustafar. <laughs> But that would yeah. have been a, that that sort of rocky sulfur like atmosphere that 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 would have been a really cool planet to explore. Yeah, I mean, like I get that. And the other planet you were thinking of, and I couldn't remember the name of, was Aladdin. Wasn't it Aladdin? Or it might. Well, it, there's two A's. I could be pronouncing it wrong. I'm pronouncing it as an, a stupid American. You're the high, the highbrow Englishman. You, your pronunciation is probably correct. Or it could be neither. It could just be Aladdin. But yeah, and. If you're curious, PB's old girlfriend, her name's uh, Kalinda Terev. Uh, okay. And you can either shoot her to force PB to get the, the remnant tech, or you can save her and sacrifice the remnant tech, but then for, in thanks for saving her life, she gives you every literally everything that her team has found on it, on the remnant. I'm pretty sure I knew the answer to this, and I'm going to ask anyway. But what is your favorite loyalty mission? Liam's by far. That's the most hilarious thing in the entire trilogy. That's what it was. Like I love where like the two of you are the one part where you're hiding in the same locker, and then at the end there's the throwback to Mass Effect One where you can keep hanging up on the cat while you're arguing with Liam. I don't know where anyone is or how anything runs. And now we're fighting some asshole who wants everyone chained. It's like hitting Andromeda all over again. Shield the bear. Don't make this about the whole initiative. We're here to help, and why am I the one defending your plan? I don't know. Or just the fact that the ship keeps turning around and just the, you know, the room changes and the sort of mechanics change. You've got to find a way to climb over crates and things to walk along the walls. Like, I know Tim's never going to finish Andromeda, but we have to make sure he at least does Liam's loyalty mission. <laughs> I'll tell you what, um, thinking back to the Angara, um, 
Axel was a pretty compelling character, wasn't he? Oh, he, he yeah, and so was the Moshe. I mean, most of the Angar were pretty cool. Like, I especially, I can't remember her name, but the, um, I guess you'd say Commander. I don't know if she ever specifically says what her rank is, but the girl who's in charge of everything on Vold. I don't remember who that is. She's like the first major Angar you meet. She's the one who says she reluctantly agrees to let you help her, but she says if you betray her trust, she'll do, I think, I think the line is something like, I'll do things to you so repulsive and abhorrent that the stars will turn away and mourn and disgust or something like that. I'm like, well, that sounds like a pretty severe threat. <laughs> I did find, though, that because um, Axel is the leader, isn't he, of like a, an anti-alien group or something, a movement. Yeah. But I mean, just because he's a quote-unquote antagonist doesn't mean he's not an interesting character. Yeah, but it was, it was like um, a Cerberus situation where you can completely see why that segment or that organization i guess is the only way i can put it exists why that why that group exists because of the experiences that they've been through you know their exposure to aliens i just found they were very interesting and like it's such a shame that you can have enemies you can empathize with that are just essentially side villains that you just kind of i think you can go through the main story without interacting with axel can't you if you can i've never done it I could be wrong, but isn't the final confrontation with Axel during Giles' loyalty mission? I think so. But like, again, I always, just for like the completionist in me, always tries to do everything. So I generally end up bumping into him before that. Um, just to touch on the planets one more time real quick, to answer my own question I asked you. On one hand, I'm not going to lie and say that procedurally generated planets wouldn't have been cool. But on the other hand, I think when everything's quote unquote set in stone, that gives you a lot more freedom to meticulously detail the planets that are there. Because I mean, if you can like if you compare the planets in Andromeda, the, the planets in Andromeda to the planets in No Man's Sky, it's night and day, and the games came out less than twelve months apart. So I mean, like, and yes, I know there's the joke about so many sand planets, but I mean, like, Vold. Like the ice planet, like physically makes me feel like I need to put on a sweater when I'm there because it's so well done. Havarl is just absolutely jaw dropping. Eos, yes, it's a sand planet, but I felt, thought it was pretty cool. I mean, they're just interesting places to visit. And yes, I'm aware that the Nexus is basically the Citadel, <laughs> but it still looks cool. I suppose the irony is if they didn't spend the two years um, working on that procedurally generated thing they might have spent two years actually thinking up some more original ideas that could have been applied to, you know, the planets. It, uh, there are some things that... I, I do like some of the planets in, in Andromeda, especially some of the ones that you've listed, but I don't know. Like, I do, I do feel like Aledon is a very good example of a planet where I just sort of felt tired. <laughs> oh, and how could I forget Kadara? Kadara is the... Um, the home world, the pirate it? planet. Oh, right. And I have a whole other fan theory about Kadara. But I'll, we'll get to that in a bit. But yeah, I was right actually. Yeah, there's a whole thing about um, uh, yeah, Axel is involved in um, in in Jal's loyalty mission, and you do kind of decide his fate in a sense. Yeah, and I guess that's especially in Mass Effect. That's almost turning into another cliche. Like you keep saying, how everyone in the trilogy, every look. Pretty much like 95% of the loyalty missions are involved some kind of daddy issues. It's almost like every 95% of the loyalty missions also end with you either picking the renegade option and shooting someone or picking the paragain option and either letting them to go or just have them be arrested. <laughs> yeah. I suppose it's just kind of their way of trying to dramatize it, really. Oh, I mean, and like, I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm just saying it's like when it's every mission, you're like, oh, like, it's like you start a loyalty mission in Mass Effect 2, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to see how this is going to end. Yeah, it would be nice to have a bit more of unpredictability. Or just even if they didn't end those missions on a choice, that would have been very, that would have been very impactful. Like if one of the characters say that you could save in Andromeda in one of those missions, they just took away the option and they just died. And instead it's just this has to happen and the companion's grateful that you came along and, and, and did this for them in the first place. 
but your role with them going forward is helping them sort of move past losing that person and i think that would be a lot you know, it might have been interesting too is if they completely took away your choice but you know how like in mass effects 3 just as an example there's like that secret counter that you can't see but you have to have a certain amount of score in order to say make peace between the geth and the Corians. if they could do something if they had done something similar to that whereas like say just as an example in garris's mission because garris is a good example to use because he's kind of like he's a happy friendly person but he's also definitely got a dark side to him so like if you played renegade when you're around him or like talk to him and said oh you know the ends always justify the means kind of thing then at the end he just shoot harken regardless of what you said or the and the opposite is if you were nice and showed him like you know like only sith deal and absolutes like that kind of stuff then he'd spare him kind of thing so like if the game took away your choice and had the companion react based on how you talk to them and how you did things around them i don't know what do you think i think that would be really cool and i think that's a really complex idea i think it's one of those things that probably involves a lot of like writing effort on their end but i think it would more than be worth it for just replayability value more than anything else and i hope more than anything that they do that in the next mass effect game to be honest and i'd be surprised actually if they don't do it i mean like just like how cool of a situation would it be if you were like an ultimate paragon and kept trying to show garris that revenge isn't always the right way and then instead of when you go to stand in front of lantar sidonis to keep Gar to keep Garrus from taking the shot, Garrus could just radio over. He's like, Shepard, don't worry about it. I'm not shooting. And then he'd just leave. Like, I don't know. That, to me, would be more impactful than Shepard have to be, having to say, Garrus, don't shoot, or I'm going to, like, kick your ass kind of thing, or however that dialogue goes. Yeah. It's like, it'd be, it'd be very clever, because it would be, like, giving you a major choice without making you realize that you are. You'd have to be a bit more careful on what you say to people as well in that way, which would be brilliant really just kind of make you think more before you say anything see clearly someone at bioware needs to give me a job <laughs> i my my counter actually just thinking about it would be in witcher 3 i kind of became accustomed to the idea that my choices didn't mean anything and um when it came to visiting the ruler of nilfgaard i can't remember his name you can essentially accept the money that he's giving you to for bringing Siri back. And because I've kind of been led to believe that my choices didn't really mean anything, I just thought, oh yeah, I'll take the money. This isn't going to really mean anything. It's just free money. And you just, I saw so started to see the look on Siri's face and I thought, I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> and, you know, obviously I did pay for it at the end. But it's just one of those things, I guess, where some people might just be more annoyed about the fact that they didn't realize they were making a major choice. Well, to use The Witcher 3 as an example, that's the same thing. When you get to the part of the story where you have to make a decision with Siri to either go have a snowball fight or like take her to a bar so she can like bear her soul. And I'm like, what's the harm in this? I mean, like they both seem like, ple like pleasant things. Like, I, like you can go like, goof around in the snow or you can go have like a sit down and a talk and a drink and let siri get everything out i'm mean, like they both to me at the time anyway the first time i played seemed like fairly even choices only to find out that if you take her to the bar she dies and i was like how'd that happen <laughs> speaking of interesting villains it's just a shame that so many of the interesting sort of the more interesting characters in andromeda like are not the main focus of the story like Axel, all of these interesting characters, and I do think that maybe we should have just had uh, more from. Damn it, I'm really bad with these names now. I'm literally looking this up. Sloan. Sloan. Yeah, I mean, whilst we did have a bit more Sloan from the books, I do think having more of her would have been like really, really interesting as well, and sort of seeing more of her side of things. I think. A lot of things do show to be rushed in Andromeda, and seeing more of Sloane and Reyes's, more of their opposing ideals, I guess, if you like, seeing seeing more of them and their beliefs and why they're so against each other, 
would have made it way more interesting and way more complicated when you have a choice between either one of their lives. Did you ever play as a female rider? I did, actually. That was my most recent playthrough, and I do prefer female rider. Did you romance Reyes? I didn't. I romanced Jal. Ooh, you should romance Reyes at some point. Can't you romance Reyes as a male rider? I didn't. Maybe you can. I've never. I thought he was female exclusive, but I definitely could be wrong. Mm. Or they might. Maybe they changed it too, because I know originally Jal could only be romanced by female rider, but now he can be romanced by both. I'm kind of just saying this because I, I, I know you can at least flirt with every character, and they might turn you down, might not. Um, but I kind of just got gay vibes from Reyes. <laughs> so. Have you ever tried to flirt with Liam as a male rider? The way he brushes you off is one of the funniest lines in the game. No. I, I forget exactly what he says, but it's basically, to paraphrase, he basically tells you, he's like, go down to engineering. That's where Gil is. <laughs> but I agree with you that a lot of the side, like, again, I don't even really want to call them villains, just like the side antagonists are a lot more interesting than the cat. Actually, no, not. Hold on, let me rephrase that. The Ket themselves are serviceable villains. It's just the Archon is the one who's terrible. Yeah. Like, the Archon literally reminds me of Idris Elba's character from Star Trek Beyond. I am the genetic inheritor of a thousand species. And the whole thing he's trying to do is basically the exact plot of that movie as well. Mm. I think the saddest part is, though, like, there is that there maybe could have been something interesting there, you know, just sort of showing the cat to be less cartoon villain and more just to be curious scientists that are willing to go to any extreme to find out about the remnant or to find out about this and that and technology and whatever and say they were trying to create the perfect being or something you know they were somehow using the remnant technology to turn the angara into people like them but they were just trying to create the perfect being like a being that was more indestructible, invulnerable, and whatever. But it was, I don't know, at some expense, like it was at the expense of their mind or something. That would have been far more interesting than what we ended up getting. Well, I mean, like the concept of exaltation is interesting, even if it is a direct ripoff of that Star Trek movie. But it's just like the Archon was just so bland and dull. Like it's saying something that I don't think they ever say what his name is, but that cardinal guy who's the end boss of the mission where you have to break into the Ket base to rescue the Moshai. I mean, he has in the in like the five minutes he's on screen, he has more personality and charisma than the Archon does in the entire game. Yeah. The Archon's very much just kind of there, unfortunately. I think they were trying to do some weird Palpatine thing with him where they're just kind of letting his evil speak for itself, but it's like there was some underlying intrigue there, like there could have been something more compelling than just that. But they didn't go with that because they just thought, oh no, let's just make him, he's a bad guy and he wants to take over the universe. Because I think it's weird too, because especially because he's the only person in the game that I would actually call a quote unquote villain. I mean, like, I don't know about you, but I don't consider the remnant villains. I don't consider Sloan or Reyes a villain. Hell, I don't even consider that... I don't know if you'd call them a cult, but those crazy people on the Nexus who think all artificial intelligences are evil and they want to kill Ryder because of Sam. I mean, like, even those people I wouldn't necessarily call evil. They're just disillusioned. That's another thing that just Andromeda does so well as well. Just, I mean, we kind of already touched on how complicated certain factions, I guess, can be. But that faction that are just anti-AI is really great as well. It's a really great storyline. And whilst maybe they could have stretched out a little bit more and made it kind of, I think they could have actually, they could have stretched that out and they could have made that a moral question episode, but not episode. They could have made that a moral question mission where you have to kind of make your own decision about how you feel about AI at the end of it. And it's kind of your end of commitment to sam whether you are committed to you know staying with him or not like it would have been quite cool actually if you could just get rid of sam well they make it pretty abundantly clear right at the start that taking sam out of your brain would kill you yeah but they did kind of deactivate sam in that mission or at least almost were very close i think 
I forget what the name of the mission is, but I think Sam more than proves their worth or his worth rather in that part where he has to physically stop your heart for a little bit so you can actually escape and then brings you back to life. I mean, if AIs were evil, why would you bother going to that ex that length to make sure you survived? Yeah, and that was a really that was a really cool moment, and I I, I am definitely on Sam's side in that situation. But just, I think one of the better parts of the Mass Effect trilogy is how it doesn't try to just preach that Geth are beings that they're alive and they're sentient. It just kind of gives you all the information over a long period of time and you kind of let to decide what you want to you've killed enough geth and you've seen how they essentially are just constantly being controlled by other synthetic beings and whatever and it's such a complicated argument and i know how you feel obviously about about the geth being sentient beings and i feel the same way but the very fact that it that trilogy convinced tim that they're not it just shows that it's not a one side is correct kind of situation it's very much a what do you believe i think if nothing else it the original trilogy did a very good job showing the geth as a as a people like they're not just quote the geth there's the heretics who revere the reapers as gods there's the ones who legions of geth who want to just go proceed a pace and not have the future written before them or given to them they want to figure out their future for themselves. I mean, they're no different than like you or me or anyone else. It's like, I mean, if you took just if you took someone from South Korea and someone from Peru, yes, they're both humans, but they're completely different. I mean, like we're all the same people, but we're also different. You can't just blanket say, oh, that's just the geth is I guess my point. Yeah. Yeah, but I just mean that the way that they're set up in the first game, it's not trying to make them out to be sentient beings from the get-go it's sort of it's it's leaving it up to you to decide what you feel the geth are being able to make that decision for yourself about like ai for example could have been a very a very cool thing i'm just imagining once tim finds out the revelation about sam he'd be like god damn it there's a vacuum cleaner living in my head <laughs> in general i do think that the biggest problem with the cat is that we don't see enough of them overpowering Ryder. I think there's a one very brief moment of weakness, like we said about Sam stopping Ryder's heart because they get frozen or like um, put in some form of stasis. That's literally like the only moment I can think of. I mean, actually, maybe there was a moment at the end, but I just feel like the Ket and especially the Archon needed a more active role but also a more complex reason for why he was taking such severe action. But yeah, I feel like they could have done little bits more throughout the main story to make him more menacing. It's the same sort of thing where like, I'm well aware of how you feel about Kai Lang, but say what you want about him having plot armor or whatever. It was kind of cool because Shepard's like this unstoppable, regardless of what class you play, Shepard's this unstoppable tank that just mows through brutes and banshees and everything in between. So to see this quote-unquote space ninja, or again, as Mrs. Cerberus guy calls him, anime Keanu Reeves, just pop up out of nowhere at random intervals to just kick your ass, and you have no way to stop him. I mean, like, it's like, in Mass Effect 3, those are like the only moments in the game where Shepard doesn't come out on top. Yeah. It's just a shame that he does feel kind of shoved in, like he, he he seems like a character that should have been set up in the previous games. Oh, I know. Or even if there was not enough time to put him in two, they had two years. I think there were there was at least two novels that he's in that came out between Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3. So they could have included at least a couple of his storylines from the novels and comics. So at least he felt a little bit more fleshed out. And again, like you say, he didn't feel just so shoved in. I think that's the best way to def define the Archon, really. It's like he's supposed to be the main villain, and yet he does feel kind of shoved in. Yeah, you could take him out of the game entirely, and you could just have him be like alluded to as like this overseeing, omnipresent threat that you might have to deal with in, say, an Andromeda 2, but you never physically see or interact with him. And then in the original Andromeda, you could just deal with like regular cat but he could be like someone that you progress as you progress through the story you'd slowly find out more and more about him and he'd be like oh i can't wait for the next one till we could finally see this guy 
kind of thing. Rather than just, uh, oh yes, the Ket have a larger organization that are just an even bigger army. And it just, I don't know, it felt like it was trying way too hard to just be a bigger deal than the Reapers. How did you feel? Because I, I said my piece on it, but how did you feel about the whole exaltation twist? I thought that was really cool, to be honest. I thought it was a really cool idea in it. How it impacted Jarl was especially sort of prevalent in my mind. And um, yeah, I just think that was a really cool idea. And I think they handled the situation after that mission when you go to see Jarl and he's just like physically and emotionally destroyed. I mean, like, I think th that could have gotten very sappy very quickly, but I think they handled it quite well. And I think it really does. It already sort of at, at that point in the game makes you think about fighting the cat in a whole different way. Sort of like how, ironically, I almost said Geth, but like if you have if you play through Mass Effect 2 and 3 and then replay 1, you suddenly see fighting the Geth in Mass Effect 1 as a whole different deal. Oh, 100%. I think even actually what might have been even cooler is if the exaltation was a thing but it was accompanied by mental indoctrination as well, like over a long period of time led to believe in a certain way of like how everyone had to be made to be like them and whatever. But it wasn't just a, oh, I'm turning you into one of me and now you're bad now. It was just a mental manipulation as well. When I first realized what it was, I don't know if you've ever played any of them or if maybe they're a bit before your time, but it reminded me of the Half-Life games where like when the head crabs go on a person, they don't completely like they take over the body's like motor functions so they can control the body, but the person underneath still retains their consciousness. They just have no control over their body. And it like if they had done something like that, like where if Exalted and Gara were like they were forced to do what the Archon or whoever wanted, but they still retained like part of their consciousness and were aware of what they were doing, they just couldn't stop yeah. it. Like that, I mean, maybe that would have been even too dark for a game for that. I mean, like I know the game's rated M, but maybe that would have been too dark. Or maybe just a side mission or something where an Angara found out about this exaltation thing and had actually figured out that a certain cat was their relative or something and rest and tried to rescue them. And maybe part of that cat was able to reach out and show that it remembered that Angara. And that would have really added something in that they are trapped. And that could have been a very beautiful mission if they included something like that. Yeah, and then you could almost, I don't know if it would make it too cliche, but you could almost have to kill that cat in order to escape or something. And then the Angara couldn't bring themselves to. And then so you have to like figure out like some fancy, have a silver tongue or just overrule them and then shoot them yourself. But then that could create like severe infighting. I mean, like there's so many different routes that could take. I often found myself way more interested in the Remnant and what they were doing, and I wanted to know more about them. They almost kind of reminded me of like Andromeda's Geth or even Reapers, if you want to say that. And again, like the game was intentionally vague because I get the feeling that they were setting up Andromeda 2 or whatever it would have been called to like really spread a lot more light on them. There's not a whole lot to say because everything is just like drip fed to you, and it's up to you to like figure out how the puzzle pieces fit together. I mean, like, the closest thing you ever get to actually interacting with one is Pock. <laughs> Although Pock is adorable. I, I do. It does make me wonder if in some way Pock would have had a significance in helping you, I guess, figure out more about the Remnant and play more of a key role in the whatever the next game was going to be. Yeah, because, I mean, I do remember reading, because one of the biggest complaints beyond, like, the graphical issues and some of the bugs that people had, but one of the biggest complaints I remember a lot of people saying was that, like, even in, like, Mass Effect 1, as soon as you get to the Citadel, it's like, oof, there's, like, 25 new races for you to, like, meet and interact with and figure out and talk about. Whereas in Andromeda, not counting with the cat, because you don't really talk or do anything with them anyway, there's only the Angara, and then there's nothing new. But I do remember reading somewhere that there was plans to have a whole bunch of new races 
in, again, whatever Andromeda 2 would have been called. And I, that would have built on the Remnant 2 at the same time. Yeah. I, I could have sworn I heard somewhere that they were told, in at least in the first Andromeda game, that they could only include one new race. And that could have even been for time constraints or something. Or, or, two, or two new races, actually. It must have been two. Because, yeah, they, they would make Kel with the, the villains. At that point, though, would you not technically consider the Ket and the Angara the same thing? Possibly, maybe maybe it was just one after one that was a loophole. But I feel like I feel I feel like they were given to, and like the whole plot twist of them technically being the same was their way of trying to make the cat more compelling. And it, and it kind of worked. But you don't really ever interact with them other than shoot them. But would you consider the remnant a quote new race? Not really, no. Especially since we don't know how fully formed they are, if they even are AI. Yeah, that's again probably a question that would have been answered in Andromeda 2. I could see them even doing something too, like having a Javik kind of situation where you uncover like an old vault and there's like one living Jardan left. Do we ever find out what happened to the Jardan? Uh, they hint at a few things, but I don't believe anything concrete. Obviously, we don't know what was planned for the second game, but it would have been cool to find that out in Andromeda in some sense. I get the feeling that they were intentionally being vague because I feel like Andromeda 2 would have been like this absolutely monstrously huge thing. Which unfortunately would have included the care again. Yeah, but at least this time if it went, if it had a proper development cycle and they didn't waste two years, or rather not waste, but if they didn't have to throw two years in the garbage, they could have had a fully formed game and maybe those bits and pieces that feel rushed that you mentioned would have been able to have been ironed out. tell you what i did like though is I, I did find that the combat was very fluid i do enjoy the combat oh the combat's amazing admittedly it took a little bit while to get used to the jump jets but the combat is so fluid and with the jump jets it adds the z-axis so you're not just moving like x and y like forward back left and right you can also now move up and down it just made for so much more interesting ways to approach combat and now that you're not especially now that you're not tied down to a specific class and you can more or less do whatever you want as far as your build goes. Like, just the combat is so much more fun and enjoyable. Not to say that it was necessarily bad in the first three. Like, Mass Effect 3 was fine. Two is a little bit old. I mean, one did definitely feel a little bit clunky, but even that, for the time it came out in, wasn't awful. Maybe a cool idea, though, would have been to, I don't know, maybe just for law reasons, just to explain it better, would be to have them use the technology they find in Andromeda to create the jump jets. Uh, I mean, I guess. But I mean, like, that's not exactly like re like reinventing the wheel. It's like a short-range booster thrust. Like, you never get to see them used, but they had that in the trilogy. Hell, astronauts in real life today have, they're not jump jets in that sense, but jetpacks. Is it mentioned in lore entries then or something? I don't know for a hundred percent, but I'm just saying there's maybe it was a lore entry. I know I read it somewhere. Look at um the three Torians that have helmets on in the multiplayer. They all have jump jets. So I mean, if they have them, everyone else probably does too. True. And I will say my favorite thing about the combat in Andromeda, and I might be part of the minority here, but I loved how they revamped how melee works. I'm like, not to say that Omniblades aren't cool because they 100% are, but I felt it was so cool that you could like branch out into other things. You could get a Krogan Warhammer, you could get an Asari sword or all these other things. Because I mean, like, again, Omniblades are definitely cool, but there's something really fun about being able to blink around as a biotic with a Asari Katana or just build like this beefy build and just run up and smack giant things with a huge hammer. Andromeda seems the prime example of a game where the developers clearly had fun in designing the just the combat in general like there yeah and that passion yeah. definitely bleeds through with just how much customize how customizable it is especially with how you can cross class with um you know combat biotics and tech if you really wanted to but the only time that kind of annoyed me was in the multiplayer because one of my favorite things about the multiplayer in mass in the mass effect 3 was I believe there's 54 characters and they found somehow managed to find a way to make 54 different characters that all feel 100 percent 
unique and individual. Whereas the same, th it's weird to say, because like, again, the same thing I just pr spent time praising the main game of Andromeda 4 is also a thing that kind of annoyed me in the multiplayer, because I felt like the multiplayer, everything was just like slightly different variations of the same thing, no matter what class or race you were. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just kind of comes down to... I think in in the, in the Andromeda Moy play, you just have to consider it as what race would you like to play as, rather than what style of play do you prefer. I think maybe that was that should be kind of a, a different way of looking at it. Maybe they're just asking the player, "Hey, what what race do you want to play as?" and just have fun with what race you want to be, and just make it about skins or whatever. Then maybe that's what it was more about. The Deluxe Edition, I forget if it's the Asari or the Turian, but it comes with one of them for free in the multiplayer, and then you can buy the rest, and I bought all of them. But I was just thinking, a cool thing I wish EA might have done was if you bought the Deluxe Edition for like the 20 extra dollars or whatever it was, um, it would let you pick, because there's which race you wanted to be. Do you want the Krogan? Do you want the Asari? Do you want the Turian? Do you want the Solarian? Whatever else rather than just forcing you. And again, I forget if it was the Turian or a Sari, but it was just, you got one of them and you had no say in it. So it would have been cool if they had let you pick which one you wanted. I mean, if you're giving them the extra $20 anyway, they should at least let you pick which alien you want or which cool alien guy. Hmm. Speaking of picking guys, though, I think maybe it would have been an interesting choice to have the player pick whatever race they might want their rider to be. Or maybe Ryder just would be a different name or something, or whatever. But wouldn't it have been cool if, you know, that whole Pathfinder dying thing was still a thing, but all of the races are in panic or something and can't decide on what to do and someone has to take the reins or something. But that could be anyone of any race, and it kind of could have became more like Dragon Age Origins, where you have a different origin story. That was just where I was going to say I thought you were going, so it'd be like, like, if you pick a Krogan, you could be, like, say, one of Drax's other kids. Or if you're an Asari, you could be someone, middle rank person from the Lucinia or whatever. And then it would be, like, all the different origin stories, and they would all culminate in the same spot on the yeah, Nexus. Yeah, you see kind of different thing. points of the various arcs being stuck at a different point or whatever. So you would have a little bit of extra information in the beginning, depending on where you started. Because I think that was one of the great things about origin stories in Origins was you started at a different point with a different variety of knowledge depending on where you started. Like, if you start in the Elven alienage, you know about the kind of mistreatment that Elves go through from the get-go. And if you start off as a castless Dwarf, you know very well what the Dwarven hierarchy is like and how it mistreats people. And you know, having that different perspective in Andromeda, and obviously it's a very different thing, I'm not talking about discrimination or anything, but in Andromeda you would have a different perspective on things because, you know, if you're a Krogan you'd be wondering what where the humans are, what's going on with them well actually, I don't know, I think the humans will arrive regardless actually, but um, I don't know, I guess you would have that knowledge of, of the Krogan for example. Is there a difference in Dragon Age Origins if you play an elf mage or a human mage, is that the exact same origin story, or is there any differences to it at all? Or do you just start in the tower with Jowen and then just go from there? I haven't played a human mage, but I'm pretty sure they're exactly the same. From from my elven mage experience, I kind of just forgot I was an elf more often than not. I mean, like I guess on one hand, that would have made getting back on topic that would have been extra work. But on the other hand, if they could have done, if they did it in 2009 with Dragon Age Origins. I'm sure they could have done it in 2017 with Andromeda. Like that's eight years later. And again, like the origin stories don't even have to be that long. I mean, like in Dragon Age, I think even if you do all the side stuff, you can blow through your origin story in under two hours. Oh yeah, easily. I think um, the uh, what is it? The human noble story is especially short. Yeah, the human noble story does have a lot. It takes a while to get going, and there is a lot of side stuff you can do and i also do a really evil thing in it most of the time just to give myself a leg up right before the final cutscene where you find your dying dad i always take all the weapons and armor from my mom and so that i can sell them when i get to ostagar 
so then that final cutscene right before we leave the castle with Duncan is always my mom in her underwear. And like, I kind of feel bad, but I'm like, I want the extra gold. <laughs> That's really clever though, that is. Yeah, it's clever, but I still it still makes me feel kind of bad. <laughs> Do we have anything else to say about the Remnant? Just that I think there was a lot of interesting mystery there and it's I, I do hope that in some way they still tie it into whatever the whatever they've got planned for the next game i would like to just get your thoughts on side missions in general because they do kind of seem a bit i don't know hit or miss yeah some of them are definitely better than others although i do like how some of them they drag on is the wrong term but they like take their time and you have to like read like you'll do part of it and then go off and do something and then have to come back at a later time and then continue on a different part of it kind of thing like the reporter the asari reporter on the nexus like you can't do all of that at once you have to talk to her for a few times then talk to her again then you leave and you come back and you find out she's in jail and you have to get her out they're like incremental stories or like with that asshole bartender on the nexus and you keep who like hates his job but every time you bring him new new ingredients you, you force him to like come up with new drinks do you remember that do you remember that one as well where there's a woman on the loose with like a disease or something with a with a with an illness uh vaguely i don't remember specifics but i do know what you're talking about yeah there was some continuous stories like that that i thought were very good that just kind of that i really expanded the world a little bit and it's it's just frustrating really like there, there are some really well done missions and then there are some that just feel really grindy like the ones where you've just got to constantly scan things i mean that's fair but at the same time how's that really any different from what tim hates the most like those sudoku puzzles at the remnant vaults where you just got to follow the wires around for forever yeah that's kind of annoying I'll tell you what, another one I really liked is, I forget her name, but that one female Angara who's trying to, like, I think she works at the library or something, or a museum, and I know you can actually even romance her, and you keep having to, like, bring Yeah, I did stuff. that. I quite enjoyed that. I kind of felt a little bit like Space Indiana Jones, which I thought was quite cool. Well, regular Indiana Jones is cool enough already. Imagine putting him in space. <laughs> Don't give Lucas so many ideas. Just, just because I'm going to kick myself if we don't talk about it. How do you feel about the memory shards and picking those up? You mean for Sam? Yeah. I thought there was, those were, personally, I thought those were really cool because it's an interesting way. It reminded me a little bit, although I know it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison, but it reminded me a bit of how in Mass Effect 2, there's very little ED will actually tell you because of hardware blocks. And it's only after Joker unshackles her that you'll actually be able to ask her questions about Cerberus and have her actually give answers. So for me, it found like it was like an interesting way to have like a reasonable, believable explanation for why Sam couldn't just tell you everything right off the bat. Yeah, that's true. It does raise queries questions though, as to how Ryder's dad was able to put those blocks in place in such a short space of time. Because obviously he didn't plan on dying. Yeah, I guess the next question or not even question the next thing there is do you believe if alec had shared the helmet with Ryder, like 30 seconds for me 30 seconds for you kind of thing do you think both of them could have survived no because from even being exposed to the air for a limited time it was it was literally like melting their skin or something or it was like really it was clearly very deadly yeah i mean i don't know you're probably right it's just i know i'm not the only person who's brought that up I remember what it, it was. Ryder barely survived after Alec gave them gave him the helmet in the first place. Him or her the helmet. You know, they literally had to implant Sam in to save Ryder in the first place. See, Sam saves your life twice. Then. Yes, I know, and I never How said I... anyone not like Sam. <laughs> Although, does it bother you at all that Cora apparently has control over Sam, at least a little bit? Well, that's the thing as well. There could have been something really interesting there about how this AI can literally see everything you're doing and listen to everything you're doing. They could have really hit the nail on the head and made you think about your own technology and how it could be listening in and stuff. And now we know Instagram and Facebook is listening to our conversations. That could have been a really interesting avenue for, for AI and the controversy there. Oh, and that, like, like you said, that happens now. 
I'll never forget a couple of years ago, I was talking to my friend before I deleted my Facebook. And I don't even remember. I think we were just talking about old shows from like the 80s and 90s that we liked. And I just made an offhand comment into the microphone about how I loved the show Quantum Leap. And my Alexa overheard me because then for like the next six months, every time I logged on Amazon, it kept offering me box sets of it at a discount. <laughs> but I mean, like, it's funny. Like, have you ever romanced Cora? Uh, no, I haven't, actually. Right before you're about to have sex, Ryder makes an offhand comment about, because she's like, oh, finally some alone time. And then Ryder's like, yeah, but she's like, you know, we're not technically alone. And then Cora uses her command code to be like, Sam, can you turn yourself off for an hour or two? And I'm like, if she has that power, that's kind of like, she can essentially turn your brain off with using her authority. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Cora was secretly working for the elusive man all along. Well, that was going to be my next question. Um, do you believe, I know it was never confirmed one way or the other, but where do you come down on the Cora is the elusive man's daughter debate? Because again, I know Harper is not necessarily a, an uncommon surname, but at the same time, considering it's Bioware, I don't think there's any way they made her last name Harper by accident. That would be way too on the nose. I think she is. I think she kind of has to be. But at the same time, I don't really know what that revelation would add to the story because I think she's clearly not a spy for him or anything. So I don't think it's something they would have revealed if it was true. No, but I think they could have done something almost like how when Ray discovers she's a Palpatine. Although I would trust Bioware to make that a more interesting revelation than Disney did. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things that if they were to reveal it, they would probably, or they should probably do it through lore entries rather than just trying to make a dramatic reveal about it. Yeah, I mean, and I guess they almost did kind of the same thing with, did you ever watch The Rings of Power? I did not. Where Galadriel eventually finds out that, I see, it was, I don't even remember the guy's name, and it was barely like a month ago, but Galadriel goes through the ruins of this like burnt to shit library and finds proof that the guy who's been helping them all along is actually Sauron. And then she confronts him on it. And he's like, yeah, I know. And then he asks her to marry, marry him. And she's like, you can be my queen and we'll fix Middle Earth and this and that. And it was awful. But I mean, like the premise, like that was a good idea for a way to, for her to find out. But it was just the execution was awful. And I think maybe that's why they didn't say anything in the first Andromeda game. They were just trying to find the right way to say it if they were going to. I personally do strongly believe that that was going to be something they would reveal. Do you think that would be weird to implement, though? Because, I mean, like, you never find out who the elusive man actually is in any of the games. Like, if you'd never read any of the comics or books, you wouldn't even know his last name was Harper. Well, yeah, that's why I was saying that, personally, I think the way to go about that would be through lore entries. Yeah, and again, like I said, I trust Bioware to do that way more than I trust Disney or Paramount. I do think they would probably do it by... I, I do think they were probably going to do it through dialogue, like, I don't know, Ryder would somehow offhandly mention the Elusive Man or something, and that would somehow lead into it. You know what they could do is they could go the Revenge of the Sith route, where Ryder could be, like, off by themselves exploring some whatever, like, whatever you want to call, like, a lab or whatever, and stumble across a video recording of the Elusive Man talking to someone and saying, no, I don't care. My daughter's going on that ship. And then whoever he's talking to, like, okay, understood, sir. Cora Harper, or Harper Cora, whatever, blah, blah, like her full name. And so I'll make sure she gets on there, sir. And then that's how you could find out. And then you could do, it would be like when Obi-Wan sees Anakin kill the younglings and then has to go tell Padme about it. Like they could do something like that. Yeah, I think that could be interesting. Yeah, because then Cora could have like her jaw moment when he finds out that the cat are actually Angara. And she's like, oh my god, how the hell is the elusive man my father? He's like one of the greatest terrorists who ever lived, and I'm his daughter. And like then you'd have to like console her the same way you had to console Jaw. I will say that would have instantly made her character more interesting, because I think one of my issues with her is it does feel like she doesn't have enough of a vulnerable side as well. And I think she has her plants. <laughs> she does have plants, but 
Plants can only do so much for a person. Do you subscribe to the fan theory about the mysterious benefactor being the elusive man? I do. I actually have a very big, long, well, not huge, but a fairly long-winded fan theory that based on what happens in the games and based on what I heard a dev, a dev say during an AMA on Reddit, that I'm, I'm fairly certain that I think is actually accurate, or at least partially accurate, if nothing else. Go on. So, yes, I believe the elusive man was the benefactor. And my main theory for that is when you do when you get to play Sherlock Holmes for that little bit, that little part on the Nexus, and you find all those of Jean Garson's private logs, and like the one where she's like, "Damn it, I knew this was too good to be true." And she's like, "I kept kicking myself in the ass saying, "Why didn't I ask more questions about where the money was coming from, blah, blah, blah." So what I think what happened was, like, even though the elusive man and Cerberus were doing everything they could to make sure the Reapers were stopped, somewhere along the line, he's like, in case we lose, we have to make sure humanity survives. And he knew the Andromeda Initiative was broke. So I think what ended up happening, because I saw an AMA on Reddit once, and someone was asking about the DLCs that got canceled that we're never going to get now. And because obviously everyone knew about the Quarian arc, because that one was obvious, because that one actually got turned into a book that off topic is 100% worth reading if you get a chance. But anyway, one of the ones he mentioned that kind of stuck with me was one of the DLCs was you're going to find out that something like 10 to 15% of the Hyperion's colonists were going to turn out to be undercover Cerberus agents. So I'm thinking what happened was, in my theory, is the Elusive Man personally funded the rest of the initiative and then got his agents on board and sent everyone off to, to Helios. So like in case they lost, we could start, humanity could start fresh in Andromeda. So my theory is somewhere along the line, Jean Garson saw or heard something that she shouldn't have, which caused her to have to go on the run. Because like when you eventually find all her logs, you find that she says something like, he's right outside. I don't know. I'm going to die, this and that. And, she, and so eventually, and you do find out that it wasn't an accident. She was murdered, but someone went to a great, deal of trouble to make sure that it looked like an accident. And so my theory is that the new leader of Cerberus in Helios was actually Reyes, and he had to kill Garson to, in order to keep his cover. And so the next time you play Andromeda, go to Kadara and just look around. You won't see the Cerberus logo anywhere, but literally everything from the flower pots to the shuttles is white and yellow. And I'm just saying his position as charlatan basically gives him unlimited power resources and money and everything else in between so i'm just thinking what if reyes vidal is the new elusive man and he's running cerberus 2.0 out of kadara i think i've heard you say this theory before but i kind of feel like you're you're right about cerberus and the elusive man being the benefactor and i feel like i feel like to an extent that would have actually been a reveal in the next Andromeda game, but I just don't see Reyes fitting in with that reveal because he could be alive or dead depending on if you side with Sloan or not. Yeah, but there's a lot of people, like what does Tim always say, unless you see a body, they're not dead? And the other thing is I think Reyes has the skills to pull it off. Because I mean, like for how long throughout most of the game before the big reveal, does he just come across as like a bumbling idiot who can barely tie his shoes let alone be a like a smuggler or a mercenary of any repute like he comes across as so unassuming which is exactly what someone with his power would want like look how long he kept the fact that he was charlatan from you yeah it's very true and i think like could you and that's why i asked you earlier if you'd ever romanced him as a female rider because like could you imagine like because even what because even like if you romance him and then you side with him and then you still don't even you never figure out who the gunman was who shot Sloan. And it's hilarious when he just kind of points his fingers in a gun shape and goes bang and then she gets shot. And then could you imagine like if you did romance him and then in the next game you found out that your character had been sleeping with the new elusive man all along? Like talk about plot twists. Yeah, that would have been pretty cool to be fair. Yeah, because it reminds me of not to keep citing Dragon Age Origin, but do you remember do you remember the origin story for the mage quite well? Yes. Yes, I do. So do you remember, like, you get there and there's, like, that guy 
who's like scared of his own shadow and he doesn't want to do anything. He's like, no, let's just stay here. Here, It's safe here. Let's not go over there. There's big, scary things. But then you force him to come with you. And then at the very end, it turns out you never actually see him, but you just see his shadow and he grows to be like 40 feet tall. And it turns into this like huge, deep, commanding, powerful voice. Okay. I don't remember that part of it. Well, at, at the very end, he warns you never, never to believe your eyes because he's, like, he's like, things aren't always as they seem or something cliche like that. And then he sends you out of the fade back to the tower. Okay. I'll have to. I'll find the YouTube video and post it in the Discord after. But that's what I mean. It's like with Reyes, like I said, he comes across as so unassuming. And so, like I said, he's just like a bumbling idiot. And sometimes you wonder how he even ties his shoes. But then you find out he's like this master manipulator and he's the he's like the effing charlatan. So, I mean, like, is it really that much of a stretch to think that he could have been like on, like one of the elusive man's top go-to agents, like, on Kai Lang's level. So he's like, I obviously if he was going to send like say 50, 10, 15% of the Hyperion's colonists as Cerberus operatives, he'd want to send the leader would have to be someone who knew what they were doing. And Reyes obviously knows what the hell he's doing. Yeah, he certainly does. And I suppose the more I think about it, the more I am kind of thinking that there might really be some, something there. And it's kind of annoying that we'll probably never find out if you're right. Well, well, let me just ask you this then. The first time you played, do you remember when you first encountered him, or at least not even the first time, like the first 15 or 20 times you encounter him, did you think he was just some kind of like good meaning, but kind of useless idiot, kind of like Conrad? Or did you think that there was like maybe something else going on just below the surface? I thought he was a bit of a kind of, manipulator but i didn't realize like to that extent that you're describing but well, the, the way you're describing it, it does almost make too much sense i knew like just the way he got introduced i was like okay i don't know if he's going to be a main character but this guy's going to have some impact on the story but i'm like i don't know what yet and then i think the thing that kind of tipped me off was this, was at that party you go to i think it's again it's been a while i think it's sloan though invites you to a party and then you're allowed to bring a date and you go with him. And then like every five minutes, he's like, give me a second. I have to go do something. And then once he leaves, someone important to the story will come by to talk to you. And then they'll go. And then after, just after they've left, Reyes will come back. And then Ryder will be like, where were you? You're like, you just missed this person or that person or whoever. And he's like, oh, sorry, I just had to run and do something. And it just kind of was like, okay, something like two and two, I still think equals four. It's like something weird's going on here. Yeah, I think that was more him going behind the scenes to plan Sloane's Sloan's assassination. That's what I took it as. Yeah, I know. And that's exactly, and that's also why he didn't want certain people to see him. So that's why whenever someone important would come by, he'd conveniently not be there and then only come back after they'd left. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it just kind of frustrates me to no end, you know, how many unanswered questions there are about what they were setting up. Especially as well with the Ryder twins' mum turning out to be alive. Like, I don't know what they were planning to do with that, but it would have been really interesting to find out. Yeah, and that was one that 100% did catch me completely off guard. Like, I have no idea if in the future they were thinking of finding a way to preserve her, or, well, not preserve her, but to actually save her. And how that would have been weaved into the story would have been very interesting. You mean something maybe like Mr. Freeze and Batman who just keeps his wife in cryostasis until he can figure out a way to cure her? Like something like that? Well, that's what they were doing, essentially. Um, their, their dad had frozen the, their mum. And um, that was the plan to freeze her until they did find a cure. I mean, I guess that's a little bit cliche, but it was still again like straight out of left field to find out that she was still alive but seeing what her role is as well in the games if they did save her life would have been interesting in itself speaking of tugging at heartstrings could you imagine supposedly when they get to the point where they could cure her and then they wake her up and then she's like super excited to see sarah and scott and then she's like where's alec and then you have to have the conversation yeah and also i think she 
could have been an avenue to find out more about the rider dad as well you know she could have told you a lot more things about him that you didn't know yeah precisely do you have any final thoughts or do you want to give a number verdict like say out of 10 or out of about 20 or whatever about what you would call the game i think I'm usually quite generous of my ratings but i would i would give the game a solid seven because all of the companions in the game are very fun the the planets are interesting i think the game was clearly trying to set up a lot more interesting ideas than were actually in the game which is just a big shame and i think just the major drawback for the game in general is just the archon not being interesting or compelling at all and the remnant not being explored when it was clearly a gold mine for a more interesting antagonist i guess if that's where they were going what did you think of the vaults because i know some people love them and some people seem to think they were beyond tedious i think they could have done a little bit more to make them unique but i personally loved like doing the whole running away from the mist thing yeah i mean like i love the vaults personally because i mean like it was like you mentioned the indiana jones before because i mean like even though andromeda and helios are completely new and foreign those vaults were like even more new and foreign to even the little bit you did know about Andromeda. Yeah. I I did feel like there were enough characters that were just okay in Andromeda, though, that I just, I feel like they just could have done a little bit more for. Like, especially for what I said about Jal getting to like the crew a bit more slowly, or, you know, Korra having a bit more to her rather than just being an Asari Huntress. Uh, that's, I think the thing with Korra is, it's weird how, like, I don't know if you can call it tender, but I did find, like, the little bit of an arc she had where she's, like, I don't know if it's resent, but I'll go with resent, where she kind of resents humans a little bit because, well, obviously she's a human, but she was treated as an outcast because she was a biotic, and it's almost like they forced her, to, like, they kicked her out, and they're like, oh, you're a scary biotic, go live with the Asari. Like, even at the very start of the game, where she throws up the biotic shield to save everybody, and even Liam's taken aback, and he's like, why didn't you tell me, any of us, you were a biotic? She's like, don't worry, I don't bite, or whatever she says, like, some snarky comment. She says it's not infectious. Yeah, or, yeah, that's it. And it's just, every time she talks about it, she's almost... Like, she loves the Asari that she worked with, but again, it almost sounds like she sounds kind of resentful. Because I forget if it was Ryder, but I remember someone asks her how she ended up serving with the Asari and Haishian in the first place. And she has some like snarky comment about that's what happens when you can rip an APC apart with your brain or whatever the line is. And it's she never like outright says she hates humans, but it's just like a lot more than once she brings up that she's kind of resentful to the humans she knew as a child. Yeah. I think maybe there should have been a bit more. If that is a big part of her personality, there should have been a bit more mistrust in her in her and Ryder. Well, she does get quite pissy at the beginning when Alec picked you over her to be Pathfinder. Yeah, but that's another thing that I think should have been a gradual progression. It's all of a Miranda situation where I think she just grew to like you too quickly. Yeah, I never really thought about it. But yeah, Miranda does go from like, I don't trust you to let's be friends in about the space of one mission. Mm. But what would your rating of Andromeda be then? I think... I don't know if this is a cop-out, but I agree with you. I would say a 7 out of 10, but a solid 7 out of 10. But I would also add on an addendum and say, if you're a, a very, very big Mass Effect fan, like a lot of us here, especially in the Discord are, I could see you maybe giving it an prop, or not maybe, probably giving it an 8. But at, at worst, it's a 7. That's fair. It's a good game that should have gotten more of a chance. And all the people who were like, I hate it because Shepard's not in it can blow me. <laughs> if you have any comments or questions or ideas about future episodes, please email us at thelpcast at outlook.com or come join our Discord server and join the conversation. The link to it will be in the show notes. Thank you for listening. But yeah, apparently that's a thing. But I feel like if eels are more rare, I feel like it's going to be one of those things that's kind of a, a rare occasion type thing that's, I, I think would only specifically be in London. It does seem more specific to London anyway, but I don't know. I don't know if that's like the same kind of situation as like that one random line of dialogue Ken has with Gabby, where he said something about Haggis, and then 
Gabby's like, yeah, but all haggis tastes like ass. And Ken's like, yeah, but in the right hands, it can taste like mighty fine ass. <laughs> no, Jello is like the like the confection. Like you mix it with water, put it in the fridge for a couple hours to let it set, and then it like wiggles. Well, yeah, that's what we call jelly. Oh, for like for us, jam and jelly is like the same thing. It's like stuff you spread on like muffins or toast or croissants or whatever. Oh, right. I just don't get why you have two words for the same thing. We're just special, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>